Welcome to video 1 of chapter 27 for AP Statistics. Today we're going to talk about inferences for regression. An example, body fat and waist size. Our chapter example revolves around the relationship between percent body fat and waist size in inches. Here's a scatter plot of our data set. So you can see the waist size in inches is on the horizontal and percent body fat is on the vertical. In regression, we want to model the relationship between the two quantitative variables, one the predictor and the other the response. To do that, we imagine an idealized regression line, which assumes that the means of the distributions of the response variable fall along the line, even though individuals are scattered around it. Now we'd like to know what the regression model can tell us beyond the individuals in the study. We want to make confidence intervals and test hypotheses about the slope and intercept of the re regression line. When we found a confidence interval for a mean, we can imagine a single true underlying value for the mean. When we tested whether two means or two proportions were equal, we imagined a true underlying difference. What does it mean to do inference for regression? We know better than to think that even if we knew every population value, the data would line up perfectly on a straight line. In our sample, there's a whole distribution of percent body fat for men with 38 inch waists. So there's a whole distribution of Y values for X equals 38. And here's a picture right here. So for X equals 38, some men were um, between 10 and 20 percent body fat, and some other men were between 20 and 30 percent body fat, and some were above 30 percent. And here we have our distribution of all the different percents of body fat with their frequencies for x equals 38. This is true for each waist size. So here we've got the different waist sizes. Here's those distributions kind of represented as histograms of the, the Y values, the percent body fat values. The model assumes that the means of the distributions of percent body fat for each waist size fall along the line even though the individuals are scattered about it. The model is not a perfect description of how the variables are associated, but it may be useful. If we've had all the values in the population, we could find the slope and intercept of the idealized regression line explicitly by using least squares. We write the ideal line or idealized line with Greek letters and consider the coefficient to be parameters. Beta naught, beta with a subscript of zero, is the intercept, and beta one is the slope. Corresponding to our fitted line of y hat equals b naught plus b one x, we would write mu y equals beta naught plus beta one x. Now, not all the individual y's are at these means. Some lie above the line and some lie below. Like all models, there are errors. Denote the errors by a little bitty um, epsilon there. These errors are at random, of, of course, and can be positive or negative. When we add the error to the model, we can talk about individual y's instead of means. Okay, so when we're talking about the mean, mu y equals beta naught plus beta 1x. When we talk about an individual y, we need that error in there too. So we have beta naught plus beta 1x plus epsilon plus our error. This, is equa this equation is now true for each data point since there is an epsilon to soak up the deviation and gives us a value of y for each x. In Chapter 8, when we fit lines to data, we needed to check only the straight enough condition. Now we want to make, sh make inferences about the coefficients of the line, and we'll have to make more assumptions and thus check more conditions. Because remember now what we're doing is we're going to take the sample that we have and come up with our model, a model for our model. We're going to come up with um, our best estimate of a model for a whole population. We're going to use our sample as evidence, as um, a representation of what's happening in the whole population. We need to be careful about the order in which we check conditions. If an initial assumption is not true, it makes no sense to check for later ones. 
So first thing we need to do, we want to be able to assume the data are linear, and so we need to check the straight enough condition. So the way you do that is you check the scatter plot. The shape must be linear or we can't use regression at all. If the scatter plot is straight enough, we can go to, on to some assumptions about the errors. If not, stop here or reconsider um, or consider re-expressing the data to make the scatter plot more nearly linear. Now we skipped chapter 10 that talks about re-expressing data and we're going to go to that um, later. This is actually the last chapter we have to study if we go sequentially, but we skipped 10 so we're still going to go to that. We're going to check the quantitative data condition. The data must be quantitative for this to make sense, which really you need to check before you try seeing if it's linear because it doesn't make sense to have linear data if you don't have quantitative data, but we do need to double check that. Randomization condition, remember this provides evidence for us to be able to make the independence assumption. The individuals are a representative sample from the population. That's key. You want to check the residual plot the residuals should appear to be randomly scattered. Remember, you want to see a line in the scatter plot, but you want to see just a, a fluffy cloud in the, the residual plot. Does the plot thicken condition? This helps us be able to say there's equal variance. We want that to be true throughout our data set. So you want to check the residual plot. Again, this is the second part of checking it, and make sure the spread of the residuals are uniform. The cloud that we look at should be about the same thickness throughout all the values. Nearly normal condition. Check a histogram of the residuals. The distribution of the residuals should be unimodal and symmetric. Outlier condition. Check for outliers. If all four assumptions are true, the, or can be made, the idealized regression model would look like this. You'd have a line, and the errors about that line would be distributed normally. At each value of x, there is a distri distribution of y values that follows a normal model, and each of these normal models is centered on the line and has the same standard deviation. There's a catch in regression. The best way to check many of the conditions is with the residuals but we get the residuals only after we compute the regression model. To compute the regression model, however, we should check the conditions. So th there's a circular problem there. We um, fix it by working in this order. We make a, a scatter plot of the data to check the straight enough condition. Then if the data are straight enough, we fit a regression model and find the residuals um, in the actual data, which are little e, and predicted values y hat. We make a residual plot, which is just a scatter plot of the residuals against x or the predicted value. You can use x or the y hats. I usually use x, but you're welcome to use the y hats if you'd like. This plot should have no pattern. Check in particular for any bending, any thickening or thinning, and any outliers. If the data are measured over time, Plot the residuals against time to check for evidence of a pattern that might suggest they are not independent. If the scatter plots look okay, then make a histogram and normal or normal probability plot of the residuals to check the nearly normal condition. So you're making a residual plot, scatter plot, and then you're taking the same residuals and making a histogram or normal probability plot. If all these conditions seem to be satisfied, go ahead and make inference. All right, here's some intuition about regression inference. We expect any sample to produce a B1 whose expected value is the true slope beta 1. What about its standard deviation? What aspects of the data affect how much the slope and intercept vary from sample to sample? Spread around the line. Less scatter around the line means the slope will be more consistent from sample to sample. The spread around the line is measured with the residual standard deviation, SE. That's just standard deviation of the residuals, residual error. That's where the E comes in. You can always find SE in the regression output. It's often just labeled S. So if you see just on plain S in computer output that's um, referencing um, regression, excuse me, then you know that that is the standard deviation of the residuals. All right, um, less scatter around the line means the slope will be more consistent from sample to sample. 
So here we have an example where there's not much scatter about the line. And then to the right of it, we have an example where there is a lot of scatter around the line. So the SE value, the standard deviation of the errors, is going to be smaller on this graph on the left versus the standard error, um, the standard deviation of the error um, for this graph on the right. The spread of the x's. A large standard deviation of x provides what we consider to be a more stable regression. So the one to the right this time is going to have a more stable regression than the one to the left. Sample size. Having a larger sample size n gives um, more consistent estimates. It's always better to have a larger sample size versus a smaller one if you've got the resources to have this larger sample size. So the one on the right is going to have um, more consistent estimates than the one on the left simply because there's a larger sample size. Standard error for this slope. So we've talked about standard error for the errors, standard deviation for the errors. Now we're going to talk about standard error for the slope. Three aspects of the scatter plot affect the standard error of the regression slope, and we just talked about them. The spread around the line, the SE, the spread of the X values, SX, and the sample size, N. The formula for the standard error, which you will probably never have to calculate by hand, is the standard deviation of the errors divided by the square root of sample size minus 1 times the standard deviation of the Xs. When the conditions are met, the standardized estimate regression slope is t equals b1 minus beta1 divided by the standard error of b1. And it follows a, t, a student's t model with n minus 2 degrees of freedom because we have two variables, x and y. So that's why it's n minus 2. We estimate the standard error with seb1 this, um, which equals s sub e divided by the square root of n minus 1 times s of x, where s e equals the square root of the sum of the y minus y hats squared, so the observed y values minus the predicted y values squared divided by n minus 2, where n is the number of data values in s x, is the ordinary standard deviation of the x values. What about the intercept? The same reasoning applies for the intercept. We can write uh, b naught minus beta naught over the standard error of b naught, with, uh, and we use the t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. But we rare, rarely use this fact for anything. I am going to show you an example of working with it, but it's not done very often. The intercept usually isn't interesting. Most, most hypothesis tests and confidence intervals for regression are about the slope because what people are interested in is if you increase the x value by 1, what does that mean for the y value or at least the predicted y value? Okay, a null hypothesis of zero slope questions the entire claim of a linear relationship between the two variables, often just what we want to know. So, this is called a linear regression t-test. So if you're told to test the linearity, this is the test you want to do. Or if you're told to do a linear regression t-test. So your null hypothesis is going to be beta 1 equals 0. And we're going to find t with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. b1 minus 0 because that's the hypothesized value for beta 1. That's the hypothesized slope divided by the standard error of b1. And we continue as, uh, as we would with any other t-test. And of course, your CAS has where you can do this both on uh, the scratch pad and also if you're using data, like if you actually have the x and y values, you can do it within, your, um, within a document. The formula for a confidence interval for beta 1 is b1 plus or minus the critical value for t with n minus 2 degrees of freedom times the standard error of b1. Okay, that's it for video one. We're going to come back and we're going to learn about predictive values, and then we're going to go ahead and do an example. I will see you in just a few minutes.